Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, um, it is time for another one of these MRAP lives. And I'm assuming this is working, but I don't really know, actually. So um, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. I didn't think we would have as much as we do, um, but we do have quite a bit to get through. And I really want to state uh, right at the beginning that I'm, there's a lot of stuff happening about this idea of a permissive um, hypo, uh, hyp uh, permissive hypoxia that we'll get into with Sarah. I think it's really, really important. Even if you can't stay tonight, please come back and look at that. We might be doing uh, something fundamentally wrong with looking after uh, these patients. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. So um, tonight, I'm going to try and um, do some sharing here and show you some slides. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, so tonight, we are going to go over sort of latest breaking news uh, with Jess and Dave Tallon. Then we're going to get some updates from New York uh, from Swami. We'll uh, get into a little bit of uh, the, the stuff with this hypoxia and permissive hypoxia a little bit. Uh, then we're going to talk about that more with Sarah Krager, who's our intensivist expert, a little bit about steroids, some other treatment updates, and then we'll close with some cardiac issues and maybe even with some thrombotic issues because we keep learning more and more about this puppy. This is an x-ray of um, a COVID-19 patient, and you're going to be seeing many of these. These are quite terrifying, actually. Um, but before we even start the show, I'm going to see if I can um, play a little video for you here um, about what we're doing, not just, uh, let me, uh, I'm trying to do 17 things at once, so you'll have to forgive me. We're also doing some public facing stuff as well. So we put this video together and actually I'm going to stop sharing for a second so I can share again and do it another way. Um, here we go. You'll have to excuse me when I do these things. But Unless you're really sick. What's up, America? This is Jack Story. I'm an ER doctor in San Diego. Jessica Mason here, emergency medicine physician. My name's Anand Swami Nathan. My name is Jesse Davis. Dr. Alexandra Ubija. And I want to really plead with you guys to stay home. Please stay home. You need to stay home. Don't come to the hospital unless you're really sick. Help the healthcare system cope with the outbreak. Because this is not about just one city or one state or even one country. This is about all of us. And I'm taking care of younger and younger patients who are getting this, who are needing mechanical ventilation and uh, it's scary it is scary out there we want you to stay home and stay safe please stay home right now because even if you are feeling fine you might have coronavirus and spread it to someone who won't be fine and could get very sick and die you can get my team sick which means that we can't take care of you when you're most gonna need it we can't take care of your loved ones when they're most gonna need it we're working really hard for you right now and we want you to stay home for us stay home for us so that we can go to for you, I think is the motto. We stay here for you. Stay home for us. We stay here for you. You stay home for us. We stay here for you. You stay home for us. So we're actually asking, oh, I cut it off a little early. Um, we're actually asking for you to tweet and retweet, uh, send that out to friends and family. It's really important. Um, the the data is in from prior epidemics and from this epidemic. If we really do socially isolate, if we can really get that message out, you really can flatten the curve and uh, not overwhelm the healthcare system. So um, send that out to your friends, to your colleagues, to everybody. So now I want to bring in Jess and uh, Dave Tallon, and uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the latest breaking sort of uh, clinical trials. We talked a little bit about this last week, but I want to bring it up again. I'll try and share um, uh, the slide here. So this was uh, five critically ill patients with COVID-19 given, given convalescent plasma, and they seem to do better than the patients who didn't get the convalescent plasma. So Dr. Talon, do you want to give us any more updates on this? Uh, um, how hard is this to do? Is there any prior experience on this? And unmute yourself, Dave, and share your video. Or ignore me. That's oh, there we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you can hear me and you can see me. We talked a little bit about this last week, I think, Mel, right? Um, convalescent serum has been used before for viral diseases, going all the way back to the Spanish flu, uh, actually, and used for SARS, used for MERS, used for... Um, uh, severely ill swine flu patients. There was a review in the Journal of Infectious Diseases of convalescent serum therapy for all, all these um, 
uh, infections that I mentioned. And the review, although they noted that the studies were of very low quality, felt that there was fairly um, compelling evidence that convalescent serum uh, was effective. It was more effective, again, in these heterogeneous, generally small studies, when it was given early in the disease. And you can just imagine, um, you know, the body is insulted by the virus. And before the uh, full force of your immune system can attack it, perhaps uh, a patient in, at that stage of disease would do better if they had a supplement early of preformed IgG. And so this convalescent serum, Mel, they don't harvest it from people at convalescent centers. I know what you're thinking. I know, yes, that was a good joke. I, we can't say that. Uh, these are people who had confirmed COVID-19 infection. Uh, they cleared the infection. You can have antibodies during the active infection. So that's important that they fully recovered. I think they were 10 days um, free of symptoms. Uh, they had their uh, antibody titers measured to ensure that they had high levels of uh, uh, ELISA antibody titers, a neutralizing antibody titers, and that was the donor serum. And these patients sounded quite ill. Uh, five, all five were on, or five total, they were all on mechanical ventilation and had severe pneumonia or ARDS. And the article in JAMA is fairly detailed. Uh, it would be nice to see more about the patient's status and the trends you know, before they got the convalescent serum, but you really get this strong impression that these were extremely ill people who once they got the serum did much better. Uh, many, uh, most of them came off mechanical ventilation and they also cleared their uh, live virus that they could measure. So their viral load came down as well. Uh, you can't make much of uh, an uncontrolled trial with just five subjects in it, but it, it would give, give us some hope that this uh, might be a therapy that can, can really work. I didn't, there you go. I didn't oh. unmute. So uh, hopefully you can see my screen right now. This is um, the only study I've seen to date of IgM, IgG. Again, we talked about this a little bit last week, but um, in this study, they had about 397 confirmed COVID-19 patients, 128 negative. This is from China. It's unpeer reviewed. Uh, it's just the usual story. I don't know what they use as the gold standard. I can't see it in the methods, but it seems to be some conglomerate of CT scanning, clinical findings, PCR testing. And so this test um, looked like it might be in the 1990 club. So um, I know that even here in LA, there's been a number of faculty members and probably residents that are COVID positive who are already getting better. Um, so we'll be able to use this, um, Dave, theoretically to find out those people who we might be able to harvest and maybe send some of these docs back to the front line. Is that a reasonable thing to say? You know, I guess the, the question becomes, if you can measure antibody, then are you protected against the disease? Um, you know, we just talked about how antibody from donors se seem to help people with active infection. Um, I think most people, most experts, uh, if you can say there are any experts in this, since it's new to everybody, um, would say that following infection and the demonstration of IgG, that uh, a person would be protected, um, you know, for some amount of time. And with the seasonal coronaviruses, it's found that you have temporary protection for about a year. And then, and then you become prone to being reinfected. If, so if SARS-CoV-2 behaves like seasonal coronaviruses, um, that's it may be similar. And if we can measure IgG and it's not really protective, then you know I think you better sell your long playing records, right? Because you know that wouldn't that possibility would would mean very bad things for the human race. Um, so, uh, you know, I think from what we know in the past about viral infections, specifically coronavirus infections, I, I think if symptoms clear and uh, you can measure uh, IgG, 
then it's likely that that person, that healthcare worker is protected. They can go back to work. And in fact, you might want to put those providers in the riskier areas, right? And, and maybe have uh, other people who haven't been infected uh, work in different areas. Um, and, and so um, actually we're gonna be doing some studies with the CDC to follow healthcare workers and measure their, uh, uh, to see if they have antibody uh, and they've developed infection and try to sort out if they're at extra risk because of what we do the procedures we do, the PPE we wear, um, or not. And we'll be able to tell then, even in people who may not have symptomatic illness, whether through working they've had an infection by, by serially measuring their antibody levels. So um, let's now talk about vertical transmission. Um, Jess, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So there was a report that just came out on March 26th, so just a few days ago, of a possible case of vertical transmission. So basically, mom was diagnosed as COVID positive. She was 34 weeks pregnant. She made it four more weeks before they delivered her by C-section, and then they were immediately separated. Um, and they tested the baby for antibodies and found that the baby was positive for IgM, which does not cross the placenta. And so that's where this idea comes from, that this was vertically transmitted. And if that's the case, uh, this is the first documented case of vertical transmission. However, the baby was tested uh, by PCR five times and was negative by PCR testing. So that raises some, I think, a lot of questions. Um, we don't know a lot else from this case report. Certainly can't reach any conclusions based off of this other than what we already know, which is that pregnant patients are an at-risk population um, and should be looked after very carefully by OB and by maternal fetal medicine. Dave, you were saying that uh, IgM is not the greatest test in the world. What were you, what did you mean by that? Um, in, in many infectious diseases, uh, IgM will go up and then the disease will not later be confirmed. So it is, not, it is not the most reliable of tests historically for diagnosing infectious diseases. Now that doesn't mean, I mean, there are some exceptions to that. And it, it certainly appears that IgM and IgG um, it would probably supplement our, our diagnostic testing because we were aware of the limitations of PCR. I mean, I think PCR we've seen has been inconsistent in the same symptomatic patient. There may be different yields depending on where you take the specimen, whether it's the pharynx, the nasopharynx, the nose, uh, sputum, or a BAL or bron bronchoscopy specimen. Um, so you know, I think there is going to be a greater and greater role for antibody testing for COVID-19. Okay. Um, well, let's now talk about the New York experience. And um, Swami, I'll show a Mel, slide. did you want to do a quick PEDS update before we oh, get into yeah. that? Yep. That's sort of the other thing. We, we're yeah. adding stuff to the, to the chapter on Corpendium all the time. And what prompted a little bit more deep dive into PEDS was uh, recent media reports of um, a death, sadly, uh, an infant, nine month old in Chicago. But no other details are released about this. So we, we don't really don't know anything else. One other death had been reported in a 10 month old in China. But we're, we've been hearing the message and sending out the message that children do very well who are infected with coronavirus, and that's likely still very much true. So how common is um, COVID-19 in children? It's probably somewhere around 1% of cases, but it actually may be much lower than that. That's just the reported number. What's coming out of China and Italy is about 1% of the cases, but there may be a lot more children around who are asymptomatic um, or very mild. And so they're not even getting tested. So who knows the real number? And um, I think there was one really robust, if you can call it robust study. It was retrospective of over 2000 kids who had uh, coronavirus came out of China. And only 5% of the children in this review had severe or critical illness. So severe meaning that they were hypoxic, that they needed some supplemental oxygen and critical in, in respiratory distress or organ failure. And I think the, the message here is to, to look at of the children who have coronavirus, who do we need to worry about? Which you know, otherwise healthy children are at the highest risk for developing severe or critical disease. And it looks like it's infants, 
uh, less than one year old and children uh, between the ages of one and five. So when you look at the data a little closer, infants under 12 months old, 10% um, of infants diagnosed with COVID became severe or critical and about 7% of children ages one to five. And again, I think that's probably lower what, you know, it's likely lower than that since there's probably way more children who are not um, being tested. Um, but I would say if you're looking after a kid, um, the ones to, to watch a little bit more closely and give really, really strong return precautions are the younger children under age five. Dave, could that be, you know, one of the theories is that kids appear to be protected, although what Jess is telling us is a little bit concerning. Is it because under the age of five, you haven't gotten to preschool yet, you haven't been covered in coronavirus like you have after the age of five? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I, I mean, are you saying that uh, younger kids appear to be at greater risk than school age children? Yes. School age children yes. are immunized by seasonal coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, that's a possibility. One thing I wanted to add is, um, you know, we were talking about antibody testing. Well, you can use antibody testing for a defined population to define the uh, denominator of disease. So Jess was, you know, wondering like, well, you know, maybe, maybe kids are infected, but it's usually an, an asymptomatic or mild infection that doesn't bring them to testing with PCR and diagnosis, right? So once, now that we have antibody testing, we can do uh, population-based seroprevalence studies to really now understand who's at risk for infection and, and what are the rates of serious complications, uh, under, understanding all the people that would be uh, projected to be infected. Excellent. All right, I'm going to uh, jump over to Swami now and keep it moving. Um, I want to share this slide again. So Swami, uh, you're in the heat of battle right now. Uh, New York is the epicenter of the world. Um, a lot of people on the chat and throughout the world and us in California, for example, um, are deathly afraid of this um, x-ray. We know that it's coming. We're trying to prepare. Um, we're getting our emergency privileges. We're getting really anxious. Um, so can you tell us what's happening there right now? Sure, Mel. It, it has changed really rapidly. We were just on last week and it was a very different ball game a week ago where I am than it is today. Uh, that x-ray that you showed is the x-ray of 90% of the patients in our department. I've seen more multifocal pneumonia in the last three days than I have seen in my entire career. And the residents sit around and we look at these x-rays and uh, we sometimes look at them and like, oh, look, that one's not that bad. It's only uh, got a little patchy thing here and a patchy thing here. We're used to seeing now uh, many, many lobes covered in, in these kind of lesions. And it's really absolutely incredible. Um, so let me just give you guys a little bit of an update of where we are. And, and it's going to change tomorrow like it always has. But we have converted from having, I think last week I said 70% of our patients maybe were COVID positive. We are near 100%. 100% of the people coming into the emergency department are COVID positive right now where I am. Uh, and I'm just across the river from New York. I don't know. They could have a little higher level in New York. Maybe it's 105%. It seems like it. And one of the incredible things we're seeing is the COVID plus syndrome. So no matter what the patient comes in complaining of, they have that, plus they also have COVID-19. So over the weekend, I saw a patient with a beta blocker overdose who was COVID-19 positive. I saw an ischemic leg who was COVID-19. I saw a couple of DKAs that were COVID-19. So they're, they're all having it. Um, and we are... We are getting fooled less and less now. We're just assuming that everybody who walks in the door has it, and that's helping us to really ration and, and think about what interventions we need to do uh, using CT scans, things like that. But it's it's really incredible the load of patients we are seeing. And we flipped. There was that calm before the storm. We knew that the surge was going to be coming. Uh, we didn't know how hard it was going to hit. So I would say on Thursday last week when I worked, it wasn't too bad. The volumes were lower than usual. And then over the last couple of days, the volumes have been considerably higher than usual. And all of the patients have COVID-19. Many of them have severe disease. There's a couple of interesting things that we're seeing that we don't really understand. And a lot of the people in New York and New Jersey and the other places that have been hit are talking about it. We're talking to our colleagues in Italy and China, trying to figure out what all of this means and what it is. And so these are some things that you probably can expect, especially early in this surge. One is what some people have called the comfortably hypoxemic or the happy hypoxemic patient. And these patients are coming in with SATs of 70%. 
but their respiratory rates aren't elevated, their heart rates aren't elevated, they're speaking in full sentences, but you see that 70% and it's a good waveform and it gets us really anxious. And I would say a week ago, we would have these patients, young, old, whoever they were coming in, sat 70%, speaking full sentences, not tachycardic, and we were intubating them. We were intubating them early with the idea that we needed to give them lots of PEEP. We need to give them lots of FiO2. That's good for them. If we intubate them, then they're going to stop aerosolizing particles. And what we're finding is that it's probably not that good for them to intubate early because we're not extubating anybody. And so we're running out of vents. We're running out of non-invasive ventilation. We're running out of high flow nasal cannula. We're very short on all of those devices. And I don't want to blame us for what we did. We didn't really know. We're, we're learning as we go, but I think we might have intubated a couple too many patients too early, not understanding this happy hypoxemia, this, this disconnect between their O2 sat and what they look like. Um, the other things that I've been noticing are these really low saturations that don't seem to be compatible with life. We've seen good waveforms with saturations of two and 5%. Today, I had a guy come in off the street walking around with a sat of 25% although he was breathing 60 times per minute. So he was not comfortable in any way, shape or form, but they're odd numbers that we're not used to. Um, on my intubations and, and I've intubated, Mel, uh, you know, I, I work in an academic place with lots of residents around. I don't get to intubate very much. I've probably intubated more over the last three days than I have in the last three years. And all of the patients I've intubated have this edema in their upper airway that I've not seen before either. It, it I'm not sure everybody's seeing this same phenomena, but a couple of the people in my place are, a couple of people in New York have noted the same thing. So um, I have found the bougie to be quite useless, unfortunately, and I love my bougie. I, I usually use it for every intubation. And now I'm going more with rigid stylets or semi-rigid stylets because the bougie is very hard to direct in these edematous airways. Those are some of the things that, that I've been noticing. Um, the shortages are real and you have to think about real ways to plug those shortages. Uh, Scott Weingart has some great posts about how to make a CPAP machine from just a bag valve mask and the CPAP mask itself. And we've been doing that. I use that a couple of times today because there's no non-invasive left in the hospital to use. Um, so we're, we're finding other ways. We're MacGyvering these solutions, which fortunately emergency docs are pretty good at. Um, so I think that's, that's my, my big stuff. The, the last one is the dangers of extubation. Uh, we talk about these high risk aerosolizing procedures, the airway being the big one for, for us in emergency medicine. The only thing I think is more high risk than the intubation is if the patient extubates, self extubates, and then you have to re-intubate them because there's lots of secretions around and everyone's anxiety is up to get in that room and tube the patient. Uh, and I had one of these and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of COVID being spewed everywhere. So we're actually sedating these patients fairly deeply, which goes against a little bit against what we usually do in critical care. We try to keep them light and awake. We're sedating pretty heavily, not just for the extubation risk, but also for vent asynchrony and some other issues. But I think what we're learning is that we don't really know what we're doing. We're fumbling in the dark a little bit with ventilation. And so if you cannot intubate them and mechanically ventilate them, it's probably a good idea. Um, I've got a quick question for you that came up in the chat room, which is, is anybody correlating these O2 sets on pulse ox with ABGs? Is it something about the virus that's making the light go through there wrong? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, different theories about this. I think, you know, we don't get ABGs a lot, especially right when they hit the door. I'm not rushing to get an ABG. Although now we, we are trying to do that just so we can try and figure out, are their PAO2s really pretty good, but they have these low oxygen saturations? Maybe there's a hemoglobinopathy. Uh, a lot of people have put out, maybe this is like met hemoglobin where the O2 sat doesn't really pick up very well. Maybe there's something else. There's some papers out of China about this hemoglobin issue. But we don't, we don't really know. Um, I think if people are out there seeing these patients and you can get an ABG, great. Um, but I, you know, we, we moved away from them. We don't do ABGs very often, but this is a place where we might actually need to start doing them again, just to get a little more information. The couple that I have gotten, Mel, uh, I have seen the PAO2s fairly low when the SATs are also fairly low. So I have seen a correlation between the two. Um, Sean has a question. Yeah, Swami. So, you know, I was just thinking as you were mentioning this edema that you're seeing in the posterior pharynx uh, and the toxicologist in me has really kind of gone pretty deep into the basic science literature on this stuff and looking at this ACE2 receptor, which I'm sure Amal's been reading a lot about with the cardiac stuff. It's on the myocardium. But I'm just wondering if that's mediating this some almost like an ACE inhibitor angioedema if you're seeing this kind of stuff. And uh, just because it seems to be if you have this overrepresentation of these ACE2, and I'm basing this basically on the SARS, the original SARS, 
data, it seems that those people, for whatever reason, if it's your phenotype, just seem to do worse uh, because they just have such a high viral load. It's just a curious thought that I had. Yeah, and I think we need more of these thoughts, Sean. Like that doesn't even occur to me. Uh, I'm I'm so far deep in it that all I can think about is that's edema. I need to get a tube in. But we really do need to be thinking about these things. I haven't seen like that the the typical ACE stuff, the uh, unilateral lip swelling or uvular swelling. It's a little bit deeper than that. And the cords themselves look pristine. So it's a very, it, it's kind of somewhere in between the uvula and the cords where I'm seeing all this edema and just, uh, you know, a mess of tissue. And and I'm, I'm lucky that I've had really good airway teachers like uh, George Kovach and, and Rich Levitan who teach you to look for your landmarks. Um, but without that, we get nowhere. And, and I've seen a couple where really I'm, I'm just amazed with the amount of just tissue and swelling that's back there and tons of secretions as well. Yeah, interesting. But looking at it, it's this oral and even further back epithelial tissue. So it's kind of really rings true with what you're saying, kind of makes sense to me, but I'll, I'll keep looking. So um, Swami, uh, that sort of brings us to the next thing and Sarah uh, will bring you in here in a second, but I was looking at, I was really concerned last week, just a week ago, of the data that was coming out from China and stuff that, as you said, nobody's surviving intubation. Like it looked like it was about a 90% mortality, which is obviously terrible. And so I tried to find data and I'm thankful that I found some. So out of Washington state, it's still terrible now. Of course, this report is of very old people from the nursing home, uh, enormous mortalities. And many of those people are still not off the vent four weeks later. Um, so this may not be representative either. Uh, this was a Chinese report, and it's, they didn't tell us in this report, this is the biggest one I've seen so far, this case fatality rate was of critical patients, not necessarily of intubated patients. So we, I don't know what to do with that. Um, this uh, report is actually from England, and they had a 66% mortality rate in the intubated patients. So again, pretty bad, but not 100%. So, um, and here's another one. This is from Seattle where they intubated 18 and they've only extubated six of them so far. And the case fatality rate overall in the ICU was 50%. So uh, these are obviously tremendously sick people. And this um, uh, there's something different about this disease. So now I want to bring in Sarah and talk about this. So you talked about this happy hypoxia. And Scott Weingart and other critical care thinkers across the world now are saying we might be treating this exactly the wrong way. We've been saying for the last few weeks, tube them frequently. It reduces the viral load into the department. They're going to crash. We've seen these people get really sick fast. But now the discussion is maybe we should not. Maybe you should be thinking of this more like asthma. Intubating asthmatics is really bad for them. Don't do that unless you absolutely have to. Better to just keep them hypoxic and prone them while they're awake and do everything you can not to intubate them. So, Sarah, can you give us your thoughts? Sure. So I think that this is complicated. And what we know for sure is that we have no idea. Um, I think that we are learning that this is different than other diseases that we're treating. And a lot of our natural ER doctor reactions are wrong. I mean, if I had an oral boards question on a patient who walked into the ED with an O2 side of 70, the answer would be intubate them, intubate them, and then intubate them. But these patients, it's very bizarre. You know, as Tommy was saying, this atypical sort of happy hypoxia, where you're looking at the patient and their SAT is 65, and they're like, I feel fine. I don't think I need to be intubated. And you're all like, mm, I don't know. Um, and so there's something we're not understanding. So I think that we are understanding that there's something atypical about this. This is an unusual form of hypoxemic respiratory failure where, yes, they're very hypoxemic, but often, even once we intubate them and ventilate them, their lung compliance isn't nearly as bad as I would have expected expected it to be given their degree of hypoxia and they don't look as bad. So I think there's some pros and cons here. So I think the thinking had been that we keep seeing this pattern with these patients. And I think you guys see it in the ED, but we're really seeing it in patient where they come in and they come in and they're hypoxic. We maybe now put them on high flow. They look kind of okay. And their two gets better, but not that better. We admit them, we don't intubate them maybe and they look fine, they look fine, they look fine, they're saying, I feel fine, and they don't. 
And when they don't, it happens real fast. I had a patient, I'm on at Antelope Valley Hospital um, right now and have had a number of patients who I've gone to see them in the step down and they've looked okay and they're like talking away. Then on my way back from seeing another patient in the same unit, I pass by all of a sudden they're to keep me at 60, they're desatting to 40 and then we end up intubating them. So there's this sort of spiral. And I think that's the reason that that's what we're seeing and we're saying, okay, there's a couple of things that make us want to them, intubate them early. The first is the patient safety factors, right? So these are not easy intubations. I'm seeing the exact same thing as Rami was seeing. The first time I did one of these, I was like, what is going on? Did this patient just have an inhalation of something horrible? Do they have anaphylaxis? What is happening? The upper airway is super edematous. The cords look okay, but there's just this edema that doesn't quite look like something I've seen before. In addition, they desat really, really fast. Even if you get that tube in quickly, they often profoundly desat. And so I think for the patients, if I have somebody who I know is gonna be a difficult airway, they're gonna desat really fast. You know what I generally don't wanna do? Wait till the very last minute to intubate them. That seems like a pretty terrible idea. At the same time, there's some staff safety factors that make you wanna intubate early. I have seen a floor intubation of a COVID patient. It was not pretty. If you have a situation where you gotta get all of your staff donned and docked in equipment they're not familiar with that you have to do thoughtfully and carefully every time, then it's tricky. You're also doing an intubation sequence that's not normal, that's not used to what you're doing. So you're asking staff to do all these things that are putting them at risk, that are abnormal. And then it's also, I think, really hard for staff to overcome this impulse. If you walk by a patient, they're breathing at 45, their side is 40 to not just run in the room. So I think there's also thinking that if we intubate early, we can do it in a calm controlled fashion. So those are the reasons that I think very reasonably we've been saying intubate soon. But at the same time, I think increasingly we're understanding there's a number of factors that maybe it's not that simple. So what if we can say, is there a way that we can safely either intubate later or even better, is there a subset of patients we can save from getting intubated at all? And trying to do that, would there be a benefit of delaying intubation or are we just delaying the inevitable and causing harm? So I think in terms of that, what would be the benefits of delaying? Well, we have two sets. There's the benefits to this obvious. As we think we're running out of things. And even if a patient ultimately gets intubated, if we can save vent days, if that patient only needs the vent for four days rather than eight, great. If that patient will never get off the vent, we can save the vent for somebody else. So there's some benefits to the system. And the fewer intubations that we do, there's benefits to the staff because the fewer exposures they have. But more importantly, or as importantly, there's probably some benefits to the patient, or maybe there is. Firstly, as Mo was just saying, we don't have a lot of data that intubating them helps them particularly. Like, it's not like we're saying, aha, we intubate them all, they get extubated in two days, it's fabulous. Um, that being said, we have had some patients at UCLA and hopefully um, when I head into work tonight at AV, there's a couple of COVIDs that I'm hoping we can extubate successfully. But even more than that, I think that if we go back to the first do no harm thing, what we know about vents is that if you don't do the vent right, you can do a lot of harm and we do not understand vents in these patients. I think it's important to remember that with ARDS, the main reduction in mortality we've seen over the last 20 years had nothing to do with us developing fancy new drugs. In fact, we have totally failed to do that. It was all about us learning the right way to ventilate these patients to not kill them. And we know that we just haven't figured out with COVID patients, how to ventilate them safely. So are we actually doing more harm than good? So that's sort of my take there. And then the next question becomes, if you're not gonna intubate them, well, then what? How do you safely handle them? Do you sit there and just watch their SAT B70? What do you do? I'm not sure that doing nothing and leaving them on nasal cannula is the answer because I've seen now enough patients where if that's the pattern, they start tanking and maybe not in the ED, but three days later, they just can't breathe, they're struggling and we end up needing to intubate them. So I think that's a little bit of another topic that we can talk about, but again, cost benefit, I don't think it's 100% clear that immediate intubation is totally the way to go. So Swami, were you doing any of this um, awake proning stuff where you get the person to flop on their belly and uh, did that help? Yeah, we just started doing this a little bit on patients. Um, mainly focusing on the moderate COVID patients that are on maybe high flow nasal cannula or uh, non-rebreather and just asking them, 
can you roll over on your stomach? And do you feel better when you lie, lie on your stomach and seeing how they feel? Some patients find it really comfortable. Um, I've seen some protocols for six hours on their stomach and then they can roll over. I just tell the patient, roll over. If you're more comfortable, stay there. And if you get uncomfortable, roll back onto your back. Um, and some patients really like it. Some patients, not as much. I find it a little bit more difficult when we get to non-invasive ventilation to have them prone because it's a big mass that's on them. It makes it a little bit more difficult. It's obviously a little anxiety provoking for us because we're not used to monitoring that way. The, the leads can get dislodged. So we have to be a little bit careful about things like that, which is why I've, I've reserved it for the moderate ones um, whose sats are relatively okay. They're mentating well, and we ask them to roll over and see. I know in our ICUs, they are doing some proning in the intubated patients as well. But um, the protocol in my, in my place, I think, is they have to have a proning bed to do that. They're not manually proning these patients. And the proning process itself does take a lot of hands, um, especially if the patient's a little bit larger. And so then there's a, another exposure risk. So um, I have had some good fortune with it. Some patients don't really love it, but we try it. Sarah, in the ICU, uh, my understanding of proning is that you're basically trying to recruit some alveoli that might otherwise not be recruited. How long do you leave them there? You don't leave them there the whole time. You put them there for a few hours and put them back and they're back. So you want to leave them there for quite a big proportion of the day. Um, I think that proning intubated patients, if you're not at a center that's experienced in doing it, is hard, period. Proning intubated patients when everybody is in PAPR, making sure that nothing gets disconnected. I mean, I think it's a good thing to do. I think that there's probably likely benefit to these patients for proning them. I would say that this is a really complicated thing to do. Like it sounds simple, right? This is not a fancy new medication with like side effects and all these things. You just flip the patient over. Anybody who's tried to do this in a obese intubated patient wearing pepper, I mean, it is not that easy. And so I actually really like the idea of proning them before they're intubated because that's way easier. And there's some evidence in the ARDS literature that the changes that you see in the lungs that ultimately you see clinically as ARDS are happening before you're really sort of seeing this clinical ARDS picture. And so I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. It's also a lot easier. So I think proning really the benefit of the patient has to be weighed against the risk to the staff and the use of PAPR, frankly, because and all the PPE, because it takes so many people in the room to do that, I think a cost benefit Whereas doing it in an awake patient makes a lot of sense to me, particularly because as we were talking about intubating and ventilating them in the first place, I, I don't know. Um, I think it does get to the question though of if we're saying that we're trying to prevent them from getting intubated and we're hoping that we won't get to the point that they're decompensating and they end up being forced into an intubation. Because I think all of us at some point, even if it's not just the SAT and the patient doesn't look good and we can for a while be like, not going to intubate you. I think all of us at a point will be like, yeah, you, I just have to intubate you. I just, I can't not intubate you. So how do we prevent patients from getting to that point? Well, I think the first thing is look at the patient, not the number, as we were saying, and just be a little comfy with sacks that otherwise should make you extremely nervous. And not that you shouldn't get nervous about them, but look far more at what is the patient's work of breathing like. The other thing that we have been trying is the idea of helping lung recruitment. Um, so there's a really interesting literature that's starting to come up on the role of surfactant in these patients and that all of the really, really nasty coronaviruses, the SARS, the MERS, and this virus seem to attack the surfactant producing cells. And that is very interesting in terms of pathophysiology. And I am developing this view of these patients because they do this sort of fine, 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 not fine, where it seems like there's a vicious cycle that's suddenly snowballing, what's happening? And I'm just sort of inventing this as an explanation for what I'm seeing, but part of me is wondering if there's this cycle where the virus is attacking these surfactant producing cells. And that is causing not only some lung de-recruitment, but this cyclical atelectotrauma, where these tiny little very sensitive alveolar membranes are collapsing, then popping open, then collapsing and popping open. And if you imagine doing that, 30 breaths a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day, that causes some trauma to these little sad little membranes. And so if the patient's doing that, whether they're spontaneously breathing or mechanically ventilated, that's a problem. So one of the strategies that we've been trying in awake spontaneously breathing patients is doing things to try and prevent that de-recruitment and cyclical atelectotrauma, not necessarily to recruit up all their lung normal baseline with super high pressures, 
but to use either some of the recruitment maneuvers that I use just in post-surgical patients when they're not taking deep breaths because their belly hurts or their lung hurts. So it's simple things like incentive spirometry or the flutter valves, but also we have now started trying patients on some CPAP. This is a tricky thing to do in terms of the exposure risk, but we're trying to work on ways to do it that it's not as tricky. Um, We've tried this in a small number of patients and we'll see how it goes. The idea being, if you can have just a little CPAP that's maybe preventing this sort of cyclical atelectotrauma with the cyclical de-recruitment where you sort of snowball, maybe if we can just prevent that snowballing falling off the cliff, can we just sort of maintain these patients just squeaking by with just enough oxygenation and just enough pulmonary reserve so that they can maintain through the course of their illness until whatever underlying pathophysiology starts to resolve itself. I have no idea if that's what's actually going on, but trying to put together what I'm reading about the pathophysiology with what I'm seeing clinically, it's something that we're trying out, especially because it's not like we have evidence that intubating these patients gives us a great outcome and we shouldn't be trying to do something else necessarily. Did you make up the term Atelectotrauma? Is that a new term? Is that, can we No, say actually, <laughs> I wish I'd made it up. It's a great term, right? I don't know if I can spell it, but uh, no, that's a, that's a term in uh, critical care that's basically talked about the little alveoli and the serial sort of collapsing and popping open that causes damage to them. Didn't make it up. Exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call my next puppy dog Atelectotrauma. <laughs> so um, there's so many questions uh, coming up. Uh, do we have any evidence that there's micro PEs? Or another way of saying this is, what other disease looks like this, where patients are profoundly hypoxic, but they're not having a sort of a hypoxic response initially? Um, it's been suggested by one critical care person. He felt like it's like you took all these patients and dropped them at the top of Everest. And that's kind of what they look like. I have no idea. I mean, it doesn't look like ARDS I'm used to. I mean, some of these patients, when they've been on the vent, um, and I've seen some of them that do have a more sort of really poor compliance picture, but honestly, I don't know if that's because we injured their lungs with an inappropriate ventilation strategy. So I think that a lot of this is very complicated to figure out because we don't know how much of what we're seeing with these super sick patients is the disease itself and how much of what we're seeing is us doing damage to them unwittingly by improper ventilation strategies. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, maybe if Talon knows other infectious diseases or other things, but it's a little bit unusual. And I do agree, it's a little bit like the patients who sort of, you know, the hate thing where they have these horrible sets and they're kind of like, okay, in a way. Um, I don't know. And I don't know if we could like, sort of extrapolate from treatment of other patients with a different mechanism. I don't know if anybody else has other things they've seen that might be similar. This is sort of different than anything I've seen. One of the participants was suggesting like, well, maybe we should put these people in a hyperbaric chamber. I haven't seen any reports of that. Uh, we don't know where we're going with this. It's a, that's a great idea. What about, well, we've still got you here, Sarah, ECMO. Um, there are reports of patients going on to ECMO. There are reports of patients surviving on ECMO. Is this something that you're thinking about? Yes. So it's something that's been done. Um, I think that this is a really complicated question and we just don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that the there's theoretical potential upsides of ECMO, which is that if we're saying that we have no idea what the right lung ventilation strategy is for these patients, and we have these patients who are on the vent super sick, they're not oxygenating, they're not ventilating, and we're just sort of flogging their lungs to try and make the numbers look pretty without really knowing the right way to do it, ECMO is sort of like giving the lungs a day off. Like you don't need them anymore. You're sort of doing what the patient needs and maybe it will give us the ability to sort of do really good lung protective ventilation strategies and figure out what these patients need while resting the lungs. However, the thing to think about is one, a lot of these patients develop myocarditis. Um, now that doesn't mean we can't do VA ECMO to support the heart and the lungs as opposed to just VV to support the lungs. But a patient with really bad lungs who then goes into cardiogenic shock is going to be a little complicated. But I think more importantly, the complications of ECMO itself and the complications that we're seeing in the later stages of these ICU patients that I think that uh, Swami and people were going to talk about later. And so things like DIC and bleeding and clotting and all of these other complications that if you put somebody on ECMO and then they develop all these other complications, I'm not sure what that's gonna to do to mortality. So I think, we don't know. I think that for patients in the right patient with good protoplasm as a rescue therapy, it is a reasonable thing 
to do in a very highly selected patient population. But I don't think we know enough about the long-term ICU course of this disease where we get people through that initial respiratory failure phase, but then what's happening? To know how the outcomes are really gonna be because I suspect the outcomes are not just gonna be affected by can we keep the lungs alive and sort of get the lungs better on ECMO, but what other complications are they gonna develop? And I don't think that we really know yet. So I think it's something we should think about and try and should probably talk about more in detail um, in the future. But right now, I think it's tricky. Swami, uh, let's talk about intubation. Um, obviously, there's a lot of anxiety amongst healthcare providers that this is a high risk time. We know this from the prior SARS and MERS um, epidemics and the epidemiology around that, or at least we believe it's true. So what can you just sort of quickly outline the process that you're doing at your place in New Jersey? And then maybe Sarah can tell us how she's doing it here on the West Coast. I think the key is that we have to protect ourselves before we get into those situations. So maximal PPE, which uh, maximal PPE, what I thought it was a couple of weeks ago is different than what it is actually today. But the keys seem to be the N95 mask. We're wearing a surgical mask over those just to protect the N95 so we can keep using those through the shift. A face shield and, and not just the, the, the flimsy little face shields that come on the surgical masks, but the, the one that goes on the head and then comes down and covers the entire face. We started wearing the surgical caps as well, uh, which honestly are great because I haven't gotten a haircut in like six weeks. So they're wonderful to have on and hide uh, the mess that's going on. Um, and then some kind of a, a barrier uh, for your clothing. So the ideal again would be something like a Tyvek suit. Um, which zips up and it goes all the way up to your neck and then has a hood that pulls around the top. Those are the ideal. Although I will tell you, I did an intubation in one of those over the weekend and they are hot as hell. I, I was in it for like 15 minutes and I thought I was going to pass out. So uh, they're not ideal to wear for an entire shift, but that would be the ideal. We don't always have those Tyvek suits, unfortunately. And so we are using whatever we can as some other kind of a barrier. I think that barrier is really important. I refuse to run into uh, a room until I have put my PPE on. And I definitely am not letting my staff go into that room without uh, the PPE on as well, because we, we can't lose healthcare workers. That's really important for all of us to be doing. As far as the intubation itself, you want the minimal number of people in the room, ideally in a negative pressure room to be sucking up some of those aerosolized particles. I want distance as much as I can between myself and the patient. So video laryngoscopy is definitely your friend, but not the video laryngoscope that has the, the camera right at the top of the blade. You want a video laryngoscope where there's a separate screen so that you have some distance away from that, that mouth and that airway. Uh, we're using pretty much rocky uranium and ketamine for all of the intubations. The ketamine is nice because if the patient's not tolerating whatever you're using for pre-ox, you can use it for DSI. I think uh, Scott talked about that last week. If you're using the high dose rocky uranium, it's, the onset's going to be just as fast. And then if you have any struggles with the intubation, they're not going to wake up again like they would with succinylcholine. Uh, I think that's also really important. And then it needs to be done as quickly as possible, which I mean, you know, there's no tube that I've ever talked about that has said, you know, linger for a little while, take your time with uh, getting the tube in. But in a place like mine where we have residents, these are almost always the attendings that are doing these intubations. Unless of course, I'm working with a senior resident who is doing more intubations than I am. Um, and then we have to have a little bit more of a conversation. Uh, I know most of our listeners are not in academic institutions, but I have a hard time asking the residents to intubate these patients because I, I get paid a little bit more than they do. So I feel a little bit better taking a risk than I do putting them at risk. But the intubation needs to be done quickly. Minimal number of people in the room. It's usually me and RT and a nurse. Um, sometimes we can take the nurse um, and, and leave them outside the room. And then you want a team outside the room that's ready to come in if you miss that airway. So you have a rescue provider either in PPE or ready to go and get that PPE on very quickly and come in and take over. Uh, we haven't had that situation that need, but it's also nice to have them outside to grab other medications. And then again, ideally you'd go in with everything you need. So we're starting to learn um, to reduce the amount of PPE we use, but reduce the donning and doffing because that's the, the doffing is the highest risk time for us. So coming in with all of the meds, the paralytic, the induction agent, sure, uh, your pressors that you're going to use. So we're usually coming in with norepinephrine ready to go uh, or push dose phenylephrine or push dose epinephrine. And then most of these, a lot of these patients are getting hypotensive. So we're going in with a central line and an arterial line and the setup so that we don't have to go back out, 
and then done again to come back in. So we're trying to do all of that at one visit, one time in that room, get it all done and then get out of there. I think these are the ideals. And I know um, people like Chris Hicks up in Toronto, they're working really hard on bundles so that you can just grab an intubation bundle and it has everything you need for intubation, but it also has your CVL kit and your A-line kit um, all in one bag. So you can just go in the room with that and be ready to go. And I think that those are the steps that uh, are really important to take. And for the listeners out there, not that we aren't doing a great job, but there's other good uh, free open access medical education out there about this. Uh, Anton Hellman did a great EM cases series. And I think the fourth episode or the third episode was by uh, a physician who led the SARS response in Toronto. And she talks about where we miss on our doffing and what are important places to protect. And I think that's a really good one to listen to because she points out some things that um, I, I wasn't really thinking about, like the hair and stuff like that. So protect yourself, bring all of the things that you could possibly need, all of the meds, have a team waiting outside to get you anything else that you need, but minimal number of people in the room. A negative pressure room is ideal. And then remember, once you finish the intubation, you can abandon that negative pressure room because now you're out of airborne precautions, back to droplet precautions, and then use that airborne, uh, use that negative pressure room again for the next intubation because they come fast and furious and you need to cycle those patients out and then bring the next one in. So before I get Sarah to comment on that, I want to show a video that Jess made about uh, further protection um, and see what you think about this. And he's protected. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think? There are people that are playing with these acrylic boxes and with sheets. And uh, what do you think, Sarah? I mean, if I had an acrylic box, I would use it. I mean, I think that, you know, these are turning into somewhat difficult intubations. Um, I feel like particularly doing video, because I'm, I'm doing video for all of these two with the same idea of like having my face less close to all the COVID on the patient's face. Um, and what I'm finding is that I'm having a lot of trouble just because there's so much edema, the airway anatomy can often be distorted, manipulating things. And I feel like my problem with that box would just be that I've never tried it, but I don't know it had this movement I really need to sort of manipulate in the tube in the way that I need to get it in quickly in one of these complicated airways. I don't know. Um, you know, in general, I agree with everything Swami just said. I think that bringing everything with you in one time, doing everything when you're in the room. Um, I also, I've been using ketamine and rock for almost all of these patients for essentially the same reasons. Um, a couple of things to add. I think one of the key things is to, if at all possible, develop a small team that does this together, rehearse it and do it over and over and over again. Because these are challenging intubations. Um, and I think having the small team, and I agree, three people in the room with somebody outside as backup ready to come in if needed, a physician, preferably the most senior person in the room, because these are challenging, a respiratory therapist and a nurse. But you can't just do that. You sort of have to rehearse it because the worst thing is a team who's never tried one of these before, who doesn't know what's going on. And I have to give an amazing shout out to the AV nurses in the ICU last night. We had a rough last night last night. We essentially had a string of like four COVID intubations that were just one after another after another. And it's really starting to ramp up here. And these are some of the first patients or the early patients that we've done in ways that are not completely like your normal intubation. And they were amazing. We quickly went over the protocol, we rehearsed it. And then by the like second or third time they did it, we had it down. So some of the differences are um, one, I like to have the intubator John Pepper. If we have enough pepper for everybody in the room, fabulous. But if not, I have the person who's actually intubating Don Pepper. Um, a couple of other things to add. One is we're not bagging these patients. Um, I think that's a high risk thing to do. This is another reason why I think the most experienced person in the room should be doing it because they desat fast. And if you're trying really hard to avoid bagging them, then you got to get that tube in fast. But that's tricky because everybody's so used to just reaching for this bag. Um, 
in terms of getting the tube in, um, I agree, I'm using a more sort of rigid stylet um, so that I can sort of get it in. Although sometimes I don't always use the glide stylet because I'm having the RT, if they're not wearing papper, not stand next to me, I'm having them stand in the corner of the room. What I have the nurse do is push the drugs, then take the IV pump with the norepi because they're getting hypotensive. And once the drugs are pushed, I have the nurse take the IV pump stand in the other corner of the room, and then they can titrate the norepi and look for the blood pressure from there. The RT has all of my backup airway supplies, and what they are instructed to do is not come close unless I absolutely need them to. And I have actually been using sometimes the non-rigid stylet because I can pop it myself more easily, and then having the rigid stylet as a backup if I need it. Then when we get the tube in, we're not bagging the patient, we're directly connecting them to the vent. But so you have to have the vent in, talk to the RT about what settings you want before. And then I'm just having the RV sort of from over there, hand me the vent tubing, I connect it. Then now that we're connected, we have a closed circuit with a viral filter on it. I can have everybody come back towards the patient's head. In terms of rescue, if you are in a situation when the patient is desetting, you can't get the tube and what are you gonna do? Um, you know, bagging is a risky thing to do. What we have come up with last couple of days um, and I think other people have come up with to make bagging as safe as we can. I mean, none of this is gonna be safe, but like as safe as we can is not doing a traditional ambu bag. Instead, what we've done is, and we construct these before we walk in the room, we get an LMA, a HEPA filter. So the LMA is connected to the HEPA filter, the viral filter, which is then connected to the ambu bag. And then the ambu bag is connected to a PEEP valve because I think these patients just de-recruit super rapidly and that's why they desat. And so our rescue maneuver is if we can't get the tube in, if they're desatting profoundly, if we are forced into bagging them, rather than trying to do our usual ambu bag thing where everything is going everywhere, use our system of LMA to HEPA filter, to ambu bag, to PEEP valve with the PEEP valve up, put the LMA in, bag them up through the LMA until we get more lung recruitment and try again. Is this perfect? Absolutely not. But I am hoping um, it may be a little bit safer than ambu bagging them another way. But again, I can't emphasize enough, if you can have a small team that does this, they rehearse together, they know how to do this, rather than having 50 different ways of doing it with trying to train 500 people to do it all different ways, I think that's when people make mistakes. And the more time your team does this together, the easier it gets, the smoother it gets, the less likely you are to make mistakes with donning and doffing. The last thing I would add is what's been super helpful for us is to have a nurse at the door who helps with donning and doffing, and that's all she does. And it's somebody who's comfortable with it because this is a super high stress situation and doffing particularly is very meticulous and you know you all know how we feel after a super high risk airway you go in you're hot you're sweating hard airway, quickly put in an A-line, a central line, you're sweaty, you're exhausted, you're super stressed. Now you have to go meticulously remember the doffing protocol. It is so helpful to have a calm person standing outside the room looking through a glass door and saying, okay, step one, do this to reduce doffing errors. And then for communication with them, what we've been doing, because we've discovered yelling at people through a papper, through a glass door, not a super clever way to communicate. What we've been doing is we've been taking the phone in the patient room, dialing the phone outside the room, putting both on speaker so we can talk to people outside for equipment, for help, for whatever, without trying to scream at each other, because that doesn't really bring the tension room down. So that's what we've been doing. It's great. I, I wanted to move on and do some therapeutics, but uh, I've got a couple of questions that I know we should answer, and that is, what are your endpoints in the ER for hypoxia? Like how hypoxia are you letting them, even after you've tubed them, is 80% okay now? And maybe some, I know, Sarah, you could talk about this for six hours, but some initial vent settings in the ER to try and reduce atelectra trauma. So if we're going with the sort of most recent ARDSnet data, or well, the most recent data on this, um, you don't wanna try and make their SAT perfect. Um, I think the principle here with how to ventilate these patients is there's a big difference between making the number pretty and making the patient better. And prettier numbers do not equal better lungs. And that's really important because I think often we see this ABG and it's like, 7.21 with the CO2 of 60 and an O2 of 60, and you just wanna make those numbers pretty. But I don't think that's the way to think about this. I think the way to think about this is you have an injured lung. It's like an injured ankle. You know what you don't wanna to do to that injured ankle? Run a marathon on it. You wanna let it rest. You wanna actually limp around for a while, that's healthier. So in terms of SATs, um, 
We used to sort of say 88 to 92 for the arts patients. There's maybe a little more recent data that 92 to 96 is better. We definitely know hyperoxia is not something you want. I do not want a SAT of 100% in these patients. So I sort of like to run them in the 90 to 95 range somewhere in there. I don't try and push their O2 SAT higher than that. It's not helping. I like to have their FiO2 below 70 if I can. I think that we don't know the best way to ventilate these patients yet. There may be some interesting strategies. I think APRV may have a lot of promise, but we do know what hurts the lungs. So I think step one, avoid doing that. One, avoid high tidal volumes. The lungs don't like them. Um, the lungs hate high tidal volumes even more than they hate high pressures. And keep in mind, when we say high tidal volumes, we mean cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. And this is a huge thing. Your lungs, your ideal body weight, it's all about how tall you are, not how big you are. Because if I gain 400 pounds tomorrow, my lungs would still be the same size. So I like six cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. That is my target. Sometimes you can achieve that, sometimes you can't. Um, and so low tidal volume, high respiratory rate, these sort of like, I see almost every single patient in most EDs, the RTs always, for some reason, initially um, put them on settings of tidal volume of 500, a rate of 14, an FiO2 of 100, and a PEEP of 5. Now, a lot of our teams are becoming much more sophisticated, but we need to too. So low tidal volume, 60 cc's per kilo based on how tall the patient is, not how big they are. You want a PEEP that's certainly higher than five, how high you don't know. I like to start initial PEEPs 10 to 12 and then go up. And then an FiO2 of 100 is also probably not helping you. It's probably causing more damage than it's helping. And we do have some data that super high FiO2s and super high PaO2s are actually hurting these patients. So you can start with an FiO2 of 100, but you're rapidly going to want to wean that down as much as you can while you're going up on the peak. The details of exactly how much peak, that's a huge complicated discussion. But I think if you do those things, low tidal volume, fast respiratory rate, wean the FiO2 away from 100 when you can. Um, those will be the really key things with the PEEP higher than five, maybe 10, 12, titrate it somehow. That's a whole nother topic. It's a longer lecture. I think HD, uh, some other protocols like APRV can be very promising. But again, as an initial event setting in the ER, I don't think that's a really great idea because it's really easy to mess up APRV if you've never done it before, if you're not pretty comfy with it. All right. Well, we'll if we get time at the end, uh, we'll go back and talk about a couple of other questions that came up. But I want to hand it over to Jess because there's some confusing stuff about steroids in these versions. Yeah, so let's talk about steroids for a couple of minutes because some data has come out recently. Is there a role for steroids? On one hand, uh, steroids are thought to possibly prolong viral shedding, maybe a bad thing, but is there a role in a certain type of patient? Um, so uh, Sean, Nort, we're gonna go to you in just a second to sort of give us a literature breakdown on that. But first I wanna just have Sarah give us the background. Why are we even talking about using steroids in our very sick septic or ARDS patients? What is the, the background on why we even use steroids in the first place outside of COVID? Yeah, so this could be a like seven hour conversation. I will break it down into three sentences. There's been a huge amount of debate, controversy, literature on this. The punchline of where we have arrived at the literature at this point is more or less as follows. It appears that in patients who are septic, ARDS, unclear mortality, but it does appear relatively clear that it probably accelerates vent weaning probably and probably reduces ICU length of stay and pressure duration. Some mortality differences in some studies, but maybe not others. There's all kinds of controversy. Um, most recently, there was a uh, the DEXA ARDS trial that recently came out um, that has now sort of brought steroid use into favor again more broadly in ARDS because they did show a mortality difference. Now, there's a couple issues with the trial. It may be a little more complicated than that, but this debate has been ongoing for a long time, but the literature has more recently clarified itself that the use of steroids in the sort of septic, shocky, pneumonia, ARDS type patients probably is helpful. Maybe mortality difference, not necessarily, but that's sort of where we've arrived at this point. And then you throw that context into the current COVID situation. So, so like you said, that's in the non-COVID, just the 
ARDS patient for whatever other reason, but now speaking more specifically about the patients with COVID-19, and I want to bring Sean Norton to this now to sort of bring us up to speed. What do we know about the use of steroids in patients with COVID-19 and what are the current recommendations? When is it good and when is it bad? Well, of course, uh, every day things seem to be changing as this, you know, data out from China, Italy, and it's going to keep collecting it. And like most times with steroids, you think it's helpful. And then as by you find out probably helping and maybe even hurt. So a lot of the data that we have or we're extrapolating is really from the SIRS, uh, influenza to some extent, and MERS experiences where it shows that steroids across the board probably are doing damage and might even increase mortality for the reasons that you said. But if you look at these COVID patients without ARDS, that really seems to be where there might be a difference and just sort of what Sarah was saying as well. If a patient has COVID-19 and has ARDS, it seems that there is a reality benefit from giving steroids. Now, this is based on really one study of 201 patients from China. They used methylprednisolone. They used fairly low dose, five to one milligram per kilo a day. But looking at those, all uh, uh, the patients that were treated, there was a mortality benefit. But you have to look a little bit more closely at it, too, because these were the sickest patients. So why would the sickest patients be doing better? Well, it could be that they have these processes that are going on that are more amenable to steroids rather than just uh, uh, for some other reason. And so if we look at that, and it's probably the cytokine storm and all these other things that are going on that makes the sickest patients more responsive to it. So, but if you wanna look at the kind of current consensus is ARDS with COVID, steroids, yes, without ARDS, and these are mechanically ventilated patients we're talking about, no steroids. Uh, if they have septic shock that is refractory to uh, all your other therapies, there is the uh, uh, weak recommendation of using steroids in that situation, these COVID patients. Is that what you're doing, Sarah? Um, I'm not sure that's what everybody's doing, but I think we're starting, at least in a lot of places, to come to something along those lines. I think that in a non-intubated patient, there's definitely not. I think that what gets tricky is that some of the intubated patients, actually their lungs aren't really acting like classic mm -hmm. ARDS. They don't seem that bad. They're not actually that impressive. And I've definitely had the experience with some of them that I like look at them and I'm intubating and I'm like, oh, this is gonna look terrible. And then I'm like, oh, I'm kind of underwhelmed by your ventilator, actually, this mm -hmm. is not that bad. Um, so I think in those patients, um, you know, we have enough data from flu and SARS that potentially steroids can be very bad for viral pneumonia. But I think that the point that Sean was making is very important that it seems like there's sort of multiple subsets of these intubated COVID mm -hmm. patients and there are different ways that they are acting and there do seem to be a large proportion of them that have this really bad intense inflammatory response and rather than thinking is it the virus directly or direct effects of the virus that are really causing the respiratory failure is it that the virus is causing a bunch of secondary things and the secondary things are really primarily responsible so i'm trying to be very thoughtful about it i don't think it's the right thing for everybody i have to sort of feel like this is not going well they really seem to have profound ards in order to do it because otherwise i'm afraid i'm doing harm and this data may change tomorrow so carefully, thoughtfully in some patients, but trying to stay very up on anything that new comes out and understanding that we're not sure that we're not doing harm here. We are hopefully helping them. And since so many of these patients who are that bad are not really getting better anyways, until we have better data, I think to me, it seems like a reasonable thing to do if they're really that bad, because I don't have all that many other things that I know work for them. And outside of ARDS, Sean, what about using steroids in patients who also have underlying COPD or asthma, things that we would typically treat with steroids anyway? Are we going to make their COVID-19 worse by doing that? So if they have asthma or a COPD exacerbation, and COVID, I would go ahead with steroids. I would treat them as you would approach any other patient with that COPD or asthma exacerbation. Interestingly, it looks like, and again, this data is just coming in uh, over time, but it looks like, fortunately, people who have asthma seem to not have an increased risk of complications compared to the general population. COPD seems to be, as you would expect, a different, uh, a different animal, but uh, 
that's what my recommendation is. If they have uh, asthma or COPD exacerbations that you would otherwise use steroids, I would use steroids. But uh, again, as uh, we've been discussing, just the fact that they have COVID do not give them steroids. Pregnant pause. Um, uh, there's a question here, and I don't know if this is a great question or a silly question, Sean. What about melatonin for cytokine storm? So uh, I've heard about melatonin. I have, my biases are uh, what uh, Dave Talon was speaking about. I mean, this is where I really think it's going to be uh, uh, looking at uh, the convalescent uh, plasma. Uh, there's actually in the US an IND that was filed with the FDA. So this is being studied. And I think looking at some of the monoclonal antibodies, particularly targeting ILS-6, uh, that's where I, I think the, the money is going to be. I don't think that melatonin uh, probably would hurt, but I think we have to be very disciplined uh, and really start studying this. We need to stop saying, well, they're going to die. We don't know. Let's just see. And then we get this, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, you get this mash of really uh, over time, pretty much useless data. So I think we do have to be disciplined and say, first of all, does it make sense? And let's randomize these people. And uh, unfortunately, as we were talking about before we started looking at the convalescent plasma, uh, at least in the U.S., it's the sickest patients with a very high mortality. So before we seeing that it works, uh, you're probably going to see a lot of people who die. And I don't want that to get thrown away too soon, because I really think that's probably where uh, a lot of the benefit is. Thanks, Sean. I'm going to um, uh, get you to if, see if there's a, uh, tell us if there's any other therapies that you think might be promising, just sort of summarize that for us um, as we're running out of time. Yeah, I will try to, I'll be very brief. So everybody knows about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is being used uh, with azithromycin, as you heard Swami say, and I've heard this across the country and even across the world that people are running out of azithromycin. So if you're using azithromycin for some other reason, like a regular community acquired pneumonia, try to use something else if you could and preserve that if this does show to be uh, beneficial. Uh, the United States, uh, there this uh, which was this emergency use authorization from the FDA that just came through. Yes, uh, that shows that uh, using the national stockpile for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So there's a mechanism for people to get it because it's hard to get it. Um, the data is kind of mixed. I'm not sure about that one yet. One that I'm very hopeful for is called tesulimab which is a monoclonal antibody uh, that's targeting IL-6. There's a, it just was approved the other day, a phase three trial here in the United States, but they've been using it in China. And I think that that's probably, uh, uh, I'm hopeful about that agent. And then there's a lot of other things that are being kicked around. Uh, uh, but I think uh, everybody's focusing so much on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin that I think will getting data with that and with that emergency use authorization the protocol that they're using and they're collecting that data so i'm hopeful that we'll get some uh useful information about that thanks sean i want to hand it off uh to um amal and swadron we um need to talk about the cardiac manifestations of this virus because apparently there's a lot more of it than we first thought yeah that's exactly right um mel uh when this uh game started uh, and this chapter started, this beautiful uh, chapter that you and Jess uh, are authoring, uh, we didn't have a section for cardiovascular. We were kind of hoping this would be limited to the lungs. And as we are learning, uh, we now have a rapidly expanding section. So for starters, um, you know, there's been reports. The first thing I wanted to, to discuss really quickly is that there's been reports of STEMIs, and we know that there's an inflammatory state. This happened post-influenza. This is not new. We understand this. And we make a comment uh, in our chapter that I just want to highlight. It says, the true prevalence of STEMI, of acute coronary syndrome is likely underreported, given that it is unlikely that COVID-19 patients will receive cardiac catheterization. And so that's quite a statement. And I imagine, yes, that if a patient comes in that uh, uh, Sarah or Swami are looking after, and uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an obvious uh, COVID presentation, the SATs are going down. I mean, who cares what the EKG shows, right? There's, they're not going to the cath lab, right? They're getting tubed. The EKG is abnormal because we figure it's myocarditis. But keep in mind that there's been reports of patients on the 
uh, the other end of the spectrum that are coming in at the early uh, stages of their COVID. We've got several reports of this. They're coming in with chest pain. They're coming with shortness of breath. They're mimicking STEMI, and we know they can have this myocarditis, and they can mimic a STEMI. So the question is, what do we do in those cases? Um, and uh, you know, is there any role for bedside testing? Should we take them to the cath lab? So that's the first issue, Amal. Well, taking a step back for just a second, I, I want to uh, make sure everybody knows that actually influenza does increase the risk of true acute coronary syndrome. Um, influenza has been shown and been published for many years as uh, a very pro-inflammatory state. And what we know is that inflammation is one of the most profound factors that's involved in turning a stable plaque into an unstable plaque and rupturing. There is a study that was published in 2018 in New England Journal that actually showed that during the first week after diagnosis of influenza, that patients were six times more likely to have a, a coronary occlusion and have a STEMI. And, and this data goes back a number of years. Um, although we all thought that respiratory problems were the main cause of death here, uh, influenza is actually associated with probably more cardiovascular death than respiratory death. Paper in uh, Lance at 2004 talked about that, that more patients are dying of cardiovascular reasons from influenza. And COVID-19 is kind of influenza on, uh, on steroids, so to speak, not literally, but so to speak, in, in that it does produce a tremendous inflammatory state. So I don't think that we can assume that a patient that comes in with a cough and fever who has ST elevation is a no-brainer myocarditis. I, I think a lot of those might very well be true STEMIs. And, and I've gotten cases of that sent to me and, and, and those are showing up on the internet. Now, what, what has become more surprising is a lot of these patients have been going to the cath lab, everyone thinks is a STEMI, and they squirt the dye and find clean coronaries. And so people are now starting to recognize what probably we should all have known already in that myocarditis is a common uh, presentation uh, or I, I guess say manifestation of COVID-19. And that's largely because COVID produces direct my myocyte toxicity and, uh, and also myocardial necrosis. So patients will present with true myocarditis with ST elevation and troponins and for all the world, it can look like a STEMI. And uh, you know, no surprise, the cardiologists are fearful of this because they don't know how to pepper themselves in many cases. And uh, no, I don't mean to be insulting to them, but it's just not something that they deal with on a regular basis. They don't know about the protective equipment as much. And a number of cardiologists in China and Italy have been infected with COVID because they were not thinking about this at all. So I think a lot of the US cardiologists are hearing these reports and they really don't wanna take these patients to the cath lab. The ACC actually did an informal poll of community cardiologists and they, they probably got about 2000 cardiologists to respond. And they said, if you see a STEMI in this COVID era, how do you wanna treat them? And the majority of them said that they want lytics to be used now and not go to the cath lab. And so I think that we all in emergency medicine are gonna to have to start learning to use lytics once again. That might not be the best way to treat these patients, but I think in a lot of hospitals, the cardiologists are just gonna say, no, I'm not taking them to the cath lab. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's not great, but you know, especially giving lytics, if you're talking about DIC and all that other stuff doesn't make me too excited. But uh, anyway, yeah, practices are going to change. And I think we're seeing different things at, at different hospitals. Um, the, uh, the other thing that we wanted to uh, briefly get to uh, was uh, ILCOR has come out with a draft statement. And Mel, I'd like you to put that up if you could. Um, obviously, just surrounding this uh, um, topic of it's not there it goes there we go yes okay so uh this came out actually uh for public comment so this is something that we're being invited to give feedback to for ilcor before they finalize this um and i just wanted to point out a couple of things the, the first uh, few recommendations uh, deal with uh, just the general public. And, you know, the issues that come up there are that so often uh, it's a family member. It's someone that you're already exposed to. And so it's a, it's, it's a different matter giving advice to, you know, uh, a father or mom and their kid versus just a bystander. So that's the, the you know, the, the major factor really behind this bystander CPR. Other than that, um, there's a compression only resuscitation recommendation. Uh, because of the concern about uh, of the airway. So that's sort of the first thing. And then moving down to the next, uh, the last two bullets that re re relate to the healthcare providers, they've really gone back and looked at the SAR, they've looked at previous uh, viral infections to see what data was available and uh, combed that. 
Um, and they're basically uh, saying that, you know, you can, you're obviously, you can aerosolize uh, during some of these uh, procedures during uh, CPR, you can aerosolize. Uh, there's also the suggestion that during defibrilla uh, defibrillation, there might be a little aerosolization. So in general, the recommendation there is that, you know, we ought to have our PPP, PPE on before we approach the patient. The, the one kind of controversial question is whether uh, we can defibrillate in those precious few first few minutes if we don't have our PPE on, if we can safely defibrillate the patients, the thinking being, well, we can, you know, we can have the pads on just like Swami was talking about the uh, video scope being away from the patient. We can have the pads away from the patient. We could defibrillate them. Um, and then after that, you know, we can go ahead and put our PPE on. And there is, there's real controversy about that. And I don't know how that's all going to shake down, but that's sort of the current uh, status of the draft. Any comments? Yeah, I agree. I, I think we don't really don't know what to do with defibrillation. What I would say is that if a patient's not already intubated, uh, I would make sure that there is something over top of their mouth. Uh, you might not want to put a mask because you can't see if they're regurgitating, but you know, those clear plastic baggies that we put patient clothing in and stuff like that, just lay that over top of the patient's face you can have a nasal cannula under that if you want, but lay that over top of the face so that when you defibrillate or if you're doing chest compressions, it'll minim minimize the aerosolization. That's all theoretical. It hasn't been studied, but it, it seems to make sense rather than having their mouth open spewing all over the team. And, and I think it is so important to go back to what Swami was talking about, that you don't rush in and, and try to take care of these patients till the entire team is protected. One of our residents sent out a really great quote, and they said that in a pandemic, there is never an emergency. Uh, and, and that really has to be true. Um, you have to take care of yourselves because if you start losing team members, the number of patients who are going to suffer as physicians get sick is going to be dramatic. So you never rush into the room. You never rush to do an intubation. You never rush to do CPR and try to be a hero until you are completely donned with whatever protective equipment is necessary. And if that means a patient's not getting CPR for two, three, four minutes, that's what has to be the case. You have to take care of yourself first. All right, that's awesome. So that's, uh, uh, Mel, that, that sort of brings, those are the two big issues that we wanted to discuss today. The third issue uh, that we had talked about was, you know, this, you know, very heavy, heavy issue laden with the ethical uh, issues of, of not doing CPR. Of, of code status and not initiating CPR. And it's obviously a huge topic and I don't think we can completely cover it, but that sort of was the, the last thing that uh, was in our cardiac corner uh, with COVID. So thanks back to you, Mel. Yeah, I think it is worth just uh, touching on that, that everybody is struggling with this. Um, and Dave Talon said it when we did our first one, this is a time to go slow. And that's really hard for emergency physicians, but you really do have to stop, take your own pulse. We can't lose a, bunch of, a whole bunch of doctors. That's going to be bad. And because of that, a lot of people are discussing this idea of codes. When is it appropriate? And I think everybody is agreeing, although everybody will have in different regions, that our um, heroicism when it comes to running codes is over. Uh, you give uh, the patient a reasonable chance, and uh, Amal, maybe you can answer this. If somebody's going to come back from uh, a code, the vast majority occur when? Who are the people that we get back in general fast? I would say in general, by the time you get to that third dose of epi, if they're not coming back, or they're not coming back at that point, and they're certainly not coming back with any decent mental status. And if the code is related to the infection, then uh, you're looking at nearly 100% mortality. Is there any specific, because that came up as well, is there any specific therapy for... Uh, myocarditis uh, or COVID myocarditis, or is it all just supportive care? Uh, to our knowledge, it's all just supportive care. Good uh, hemodynamic support, go early depressors, manage the airway carefully if you need it. And, and that's about all we have right now. So I'm going to throw it open to all of the faculty. Is there anything that uh, you specifically want to say in just these last few minutes that you think uh, we should have touched on? Yeah, I want to I want to ask my critical care cardiology colleagues. Um, Amal, you mentioned the association of influenza with ACS, right? And influenza actually has been associated with not only cardiac disease and stroke, but but other sort of decompensating medical conditions. And I think as I work, I see COVID patients with presentations where I wouldn't expect COVID. 
And it's gotten to the point where my routine, it's not yet a hospital policy, is, is to test everybody who's sick enough to be admitted. And, and so I'm just wondering, I don't know if Sarah's still on the line or, or uh, your, your observations, if you're getting a sense that you're finding COVID associated with, uh, you know, people with liver failure who decompensate, patients who go into DKA, but who don't have ILI type of presentations. And yeah. Maybe it's not, yes, we discovered myocarditis, uh, but maybe this is maybe the the effect of COVID is much broader than we ever expected. Yeah, I'll I'll take a moment and then throw it over to Sarah. My theory is simply that we are slowly discovering that systemic inflammation is a profound risk factor for an awful lot of diseases. I mean, for example, if you take a look at lupus, which is the hallmark of systemic inflammatory diseases, just think about how many different systems can be involved in a patient who has lupus is because of inflammation. And my, my guess, my theory is that because COVID is associated with so much systemic inflammation, we're seeing presentations that pop up way beyond the lungs, but in the heart, in the liver, uh, probably in the joints and, and so on. Sarah, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting to have the perspective of seeing the patients who are admitted by the ED and often are, at least at first now, are not a COVID rule out because they came in with something abdominal pain and nausea or diarrhea or something like that. And then two days later, we end up in a perirespiratory arrest situation intubating them and then they turn out to be COVID positive. So I think that one issue is that Again, what we know is that we don't know. I think that we don't know the full extent of what this disease process causes systemically outside of what we're seeing in the lungs. Um, and hopefully we'll get to understand that. But I also do think there's a chicken egg thing because as Swami was talking about, once you get to a certain population prevalence, I mean, now you're gonna have people coming in for all the usual things they would come in with anyways, who are incidentally gonna be COVID positive. So I think it's gonna be hard to figure out what's a true, true unrelated and what is a sort of COVID associated thing. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to add um, in a big picture way that I think is really important is in general with these patients, now is not the time to go crazy with the fluids. Now is not the time to do the sepsis order set and give them 30 cc's per kilo. Um, there's a lot of debate in the critical care literature about a lot of things about these patients, but this is one topic that everybody pretty much agrees on. Flooding these patients with fluid, bad idea. You're not helping their lungs. You just sort of have to say, what's my biggest problem right now? It's their lungs. Um, and so these are patients that I'm definitely going to pressors early. They often do get hypotensive peri intubation, but I'm being very gentle with the fluids um, and going to pressors early. Well, I think we'll end it there uh, for tonight. Um, I keep thinking that, oh, well, we know everything. We won't have to do this next week. And each week there's more and more and more stuff to talk about. So I wanna thank all of our faculty here tonight, everybody in the chat room that has been chatting away. We never can get to all of your questions, but we'll try and um, find the best ones and we'll bring them up um, next week and uh, be safe out there. I know this is uh, profoundly scary for healthcare workers as well, and it's okay to be anxious. And that's why we're doing this. Talk to your colleagues. They're the people that really understand this. I don't know if I've said this before on one of the live events, but I was saying internally that this feels like 1992 to me when we were intubating people every single night with PCP pneumonia and the AIDS crisis was at its peak and we were scared to death. We didn't know how uh, infectious this was, whether we were going to catch it, but uh, we got through it and we were better for it and we'll get through this as well, but we're about to go through a very difficult time here, but I think we're going to be okay because we know how to do this stuff. So thanks again and uh, we'll talk to you all again next week.